Hi, everyone. Um, so great to see you all here as we're all coming in. Um, lots of familiar faces. Um, yes. I think I'm just going to get started as folks continue to arrive and be let into the room. My name is Emilio Martinez Pope. I'm an artist currently based in Philadelphia and an MFA MCP candidate at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining us this evening for art at covid.edu. I just wanted to preface Tusif Noor's introduction by sharing a bit about how this event came to be. This forum emerged out of a constellation of responses by students, MFAs in particular to us, um, to colleges and universities across the country closing their doors without a deeper consideration for the conditions of their student body, their workers, faculty, and neighbors. Over the past two to three months, we have been in dialogue, tracking the evolving conditions of how universities are responding to COVID. As we know, this is a disease that follows the lines of structural racism, disproportionately impacting Black communities, Indigenous communities, workers, and communities of color. And that has been enabled by a belligerent president who has pronounced that schools must open in the fall in full denial of the life and death implications of reopening, which have already been demonstrated in the new epicenters of the US, Florida and Texas. In our meetings and in the others we are networked to, we have shifted from responding to the current state of our compromised education to a broader interrogation of our field, asking, why, as a visual arts field, we depend on a form of accreditation that can lead to profound destabilizing of future generations of artists in the form of staggering amounts of debt, low wages, and entrenched racist power dynamics in our institutions. We know that there is no return to normal. In fact, we must insist on this truth. We will also hear from students and faculty together in some cases who are working in numerous ways in and outside of the constraints of the institution to reimagine and assert what a better model for higher arts education could look like. And so we hope that this forum will foment new and strengthen ongoing dialogues around these issues that are so pressing in our classrooms and in our field. I want to thank Lily, Josie, Karina, and everyone at Q for hosting us this evening um, and for your ongoing support in the creation of this event. Lastly, I wanted to ask um, that for this initial field report section uh, for our participants, if you could turn off your video as a means to keep the Zoom connection strong and also a reminder to remain muted to ensure clear audio. Um, and now I will pass it off to Tusif Noor who will further introduce our speakers and topics we'll be covering. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Emilio. Uh, thank you to everyone at Q, Lily, Josie, Karina, um, for organizing this event and to all the brilliant artists for convening this urgent question uh, so quickly and so thoughtfully. Uh, my name is Tusif Noor and I'm a freelance critic and curator. And in my curatorial work, I've worked really closely with artists who are pursuing or have recently come out of fine arts graduate programs. The term exposure originates from Middle French terms meaning to lay open or to set forth. It's from this dainty etymology that we derive the exposition. Displays of objects of interest, including artworks, for which um, the advent of salon style exhibitions in the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, the artworks were crammed onto the walls of purpose built urban spaces, accelerating the perception of the artist as that exceptional individual who, having undertaken the necessary training and developing the requisite skills at the right institutions, could present the fruits of their tutelage for consumption. So it's a dark little coincidence today that for the artists enmeshed in our contemporary system of production and circulation, exposure has become a cynical little shorthand for undervalued and exploited labor. In the midst of a global pandemic and the eruption of worldwide protests against the pervasive conditions of racism and anti-Blackness, the term exposure takes on another connotation of laying bare the forms of racism, misogyny, and exploitation that buttress art institutions 
and institutions of higher learning. Such revelations and exposures, however, are but the first step in marshalling real change between individuals and institutions. It is these very individuals who demonstrate the solidarity that is so necessary for real reform to happen. In the midst of the pandemic, MFA student artists across the country were shunted from their studios, tasked with securing new housing, sourcing supplies and studio space, and are required to continue teaching and producing work, all while being denied access and transparency to the university's plans. We know that artists are meant to be creative, to find solutions to societal problems. We know too that creativity comes at an ever skyrocketing cost and the demands of artistic professionalization require expensive investments. As market pressures continue to encroach on artistic life and curators, dealers, and gallerists prowl thesis shows searching for the next big thing, student artists face ever more pressure to invest in graduate education. Once an optional addendum to an artist's CV, a way to get more feedback on your practice, maybe make some friends along the way. The MFA has now practically become a requirement for any artist hoping to secure institutional support. But to put it simply, school isn't cheap. Suffice it to say that when students demands for tuition refunds in the midst of the pandemic, uh, a number of art institutions were rejected or pathetically ignored. It was clear that these colleges and universities some of which have endowments in the billions, did so with an awareness of their students' positions, including international students left in the lurch of the university's failed leadership. Just yesterday, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, and the SEVP announced a new policy detailing that international students in the U.S. whose universities switched to online-only classes would be at risk of deportation. This effectively forces colleges to either hold more in-person classes and jeopardize student health or force students out of this country entirely. We cannot stress enough that if universities do not fight this cruel and calculated policy, they are choosing, as they have consistently chosen, to value profit over people. Beginning in the 1980s, government funding for public and private colleges in the U.S. has sharply decreased, forcing institutions to market themselves to an ever-growing pool of applicants, notably international students who have to pay full tuition rates. This is even as faculty positions have decreased. Such neoliberal policies, combined with the adjunctification of instruction, indicate that the university has increasingly morphed into a site for administration rather than instruction shifting the onus of learning and teaching onto students and increasingly onto part-time faculty. Add to this the stultifying conditions of art instruction in particular, with the storied Cooper Union ending its free tuition policy and the unceremonious closure of the San Francisco Art Institute, and the extent of institutional failure becomes more and more clear. Tonight's first field report will delve more deeply into these issues, examining the broken social contract between institutions and art students. These contracts set up both financial and educational expectations and undergird the structure of contemporary education, but in a landscape defined by economic, social, and political uncertainty, it's worth considering what purpose they should serve in the future. The lack of transparency and financial support are just some of the many ways that the relationship between institutional art education and students is perhaps irreparably broken. Understanding intangible failures of art institutions to recognize the significance of care, intimacy, and pedagogy, and their relation to social replication is essential to understanding art production and education. The subsequent field reports in tonight's event will focus precisely on how care, intimacy, and pedagogy must be examined and reimagined. Following the field reports, we'll have three simultaneous breakout sessions. The first of these breakout sessions, which if you'd like to attend, please stay in this Zoom, uh, will be led by the Intimacy Working Group. And they will look closer at how collective structures that facilitate intimacy can address the inequities in our institutions. The breakout group, which you can attend by following the links in the chat, will be led by Sharon Hayes and A.K. Burns, and we'll look at how the classroom experience can address the cultural shifts brought about by protests in the pandemic. And the last breakout session with Dana DiGiulio at Nenenge Diest Akpam will probe more deeply into student expectations of care from institutions. 
talking about these ideas is essential in order for art education to serve any relevance and purpose in our increasingly uncertain future. Relevance and purpose are key terms for us to keep in mind tonight. Scaffolding this entire discussion and the entire system of our education are two related questions. What does an artist do for society and what purpose does art serve? We want to be clear here that we are not naive about the relationship between art and society, nor do we want to support the misguided notion propagated by many institutions that art and artists must be instrumentalized in order for their value to be recognized, that their value must be entirely tangible, monetized, and enveloped into a botched and unjust mode of administrative accounting. What this event hopes to do is what artists have done throughout time provide new ways for us to materialize a better world. Our first field report, The Nature of the Case, Contracts, Tuition, and Educational Expectations, will be led by Kayla Mechi Chambers and Narendra Haynes. Kayla is an interdisciplinary artist based in New York City and Jersey City, and a visual art MFA candidate at Columbia University, concentrating in printmaking. Narendra is an interdisciplinary artist with a background in painting and is currently an MFA student at the University of Pennsylvania. Well, uh, thank you, Tusa, for that lovely introduction. Yes, thanks, Tusa. Hi, everyone. So, as I'm sure we're all aware, uh, when COVID-19 arrived in the U.S., colleges and universities scrambled to close campuses and move to an online format. Students across the country uh, have been calling for full or partial tuition refunds to compensate for can canceled classes and other losses to their education. This has led to well over 100 lawsuits filed against universities in the U.S. alone, and this number is growing. The basis of many of these lawsuits, including this class action suit filed against Columbia University back in April, is breach of contract and unjust enrichment. Essentially, what these lawsuits argue is that universities are breaking their contracts with students by collecting tuition without delivering what students were promised when they enrolled. Our discussion today will hopefully show how this is particularly true for MFA students uh, but first, let's ask the question, what contracts actually exist between students and universities? Right. So uh, here's the thing. There is no itemized list. There's no explicit written contract. Um, what we have as students is a type of implied contract, uh, which is a legally binding obligation based on circumstances, conduct, and actions that make up an agreement between parties. So the terms are unwritten. So when we enroll, we enter into an implied contract with the institution? Yes, exactly. And what we're talking about here is between students and institutions. Um, faculty add in another complex layer caught somewhere in between. And their degree of power depends on their explicit contracts with the institution. But for the purposes of this presentation, contracts are essentially agreements. And an implied contract is an unwritten agreement. In researching for this talk, I came across this really relevant quote from Virginia Held. Uh, Contemporary Western society is in the grip of contractual thinking. Yeah, I guess uh, contracts aren't just legal documents. Uh, they represent a transactional mode of thinking that is sadly prevalent in our patriarchal societies. Uh, it's also interesting that Virginia Held was writing uh, about this in the late 80s and early 90s at the same time that neoliberalism was turning universities into these contract hierarchies uh, that we have today. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, so when we talk about contracts, we have to talk about money. Uh, this is a partial breakdown of the costs of attendance at Columbia School of the Arts. Um, in tuition, fees, and expenses, students pay nearly $100,000 a year. As students, how do we justify this? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, tuitions are, are high across the board. Uh, at Penn, it's 77000 a year, including fees and living expenses. Uh, but Columbia's is, is insane. 
Um, obviously, it's not e easy to, to go tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars into debt for an advanced art degree. Uh, personally, it took me years to decide it was worth the cost to attend an MFA program. And I spent this time uh, doing online research, looking at programs, websites, pouring over brochures and marketing materials, uh, talking to current students and alumni and taking campus tours, all to get a clear picture of what I believed I would be getting at each program. So I was essentially weighing the cost of attendance against everything the university offered that could facilitate my development as an artist and lead to professional opportunities. And campus resources are, are central to this. So oh, Mary McSwain, see what she wants. Okay. So here's a page from Penn's website advertising a range of facilities that students use to make their work. Note the studios, uh, which are typically a necessity to function as an artist at all. So once campus is closed in March, students who didn't have space or resources to set up a studio at home really just couldn't make their work anymore. So imagine that you're paying, you know, tens. Uh, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars in tuition, and you can't even make half art for half the semester. Uh, these are website snippets from Yale, NYU, RISD, UCLA, Columbia. These are just a few examples. Um, facilities like these are at the core of every MFA program. And not surprisingly, universities use these resources to market themselves to prospective students. This that's the expectation that, implied in the agreement to enroll, access to facilities is essential. And uh, generally, what's advertised on these sites are just broad categories. Um, when students go on tours, they ask what specific equipment is available for use. Um, these are just some of the resources MFA students um, regularly access at Columbia. I apologize for the noise. It's a very loud car outside of my window. But um, anyways, yeah, so these resources are, are extremely important for students uh, and, and go a long way in justifying the price tag. Um, and they ultimately become criteria we use to pick one program over another. And having access to these resources isn't just a perk. It's really what allows us to advance our work. And at an MFA program, advancing our work is our education. Exactly. Um, then in addition to facilities, there's exhibitions, curriculum, career development, um, etc. All of this builds students' understanding of what they'll receive when they enroll. So uh, the implied contract we're talking about looks something like this. Uh, when we exchange tuition, fees, our time, talent, um, we, do, we do so believing we're signing up for access to specific facilities, in-person learning, career advancing opportunities, and other resources that together make it worth the cost. Okay, but with remote learning, a lot of what's listed on the right column is no longer available to us. Yep, you're right. Uh, what we're left with during COVID looks um, more like this. Wow, yeah, that's a lot of items crossed off. Yeah, the, the sacrifices that students make um, are the same. In fact, each year costs continue to go up, but what we're receiving looks totally different at this time. Okay, so this is how students understand the MFA contract. Do institutions have a different understanding? Why, yes, Narendra, thank you for asking. It looks uh, like this. <laughs> as, um, as COVID has revealed, things look very different from the perspective of the institution. The student side of the contract is the same, but the institution side is much, much more vague. Uh, in the institutional imagination, they're simply delivering an education and a degree and the prestige that comes with it. And how do campus closures and the move to online learning impact this picture? Well, it looks uh, exactly the same. Yeah, that's sad. Uh, and, it, and it was sad to find out that this is the actual position our institutions are taking. Uh, when we tried to plead our case to our higher administration at Penn, we learned the disturbing fact that Penn, along with many other schools, are refusing to recognize the distinction between in-person and online learning. So their solution is to offer us whatever they can online and claim we're getting the same education uh, as, that we would if we were in person. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that um, for the institutions, that's kind of the crux of the issue. 
um, it's this policy of invalidation. Um, if the higher administration were to say something like, look, we know your education is damaged, uh, we'll make it up to you, then they would in essence be admitting breach of contract. Um, so they have to say, you're getting your education, there is no law. Yeah, and that's a, an absurd position because everybody knows an online degree is significantly cheaper than in person, and the reasons for that are, are fairly obvious. But let's go back to the MFA contract in the student's mind. We haven't really touched on exhibitions, career development, in-person critiques, or studio visits, which are all important aspects of getting an MFA. We don't have much time left, but I do think it's worth saying a few things about studio visits and critiques because the majority of our education is in this format. Now it's a truism that if you really want to understand an artwork, you have to see it in person. This is because so much of what is communicated comes from the artwork's physical presence, its scale, relationships between objects in a space, subtleties in color and texture, and other things that just can't accurately be communicated on a two-dimensional screen. So switching to online uh, studio visits and critique really limits our ability to talk about our work and this significantly diminishes our education. So does remote learning fulfill this contract? Well, certainly not the contract that the students thought they were entering into and I hope we've shown why that is the case. Now it is true that many universities are attempting hybrid models next semester, which would allow for limited access to studios and in-person instruction and severely limited access to facilities and resources, but they can't even guarantee this. Uh, we just don't know how the virus will play out in the fall and there's a good chance we'll be right back in quarantine again. So there's a strong sentiment among current and incoming students that considering all the restrictions, limitations, and uncertainties, I, it's just not the, uh, worth the price tag anymore. Um, and this is exacerbated by feelings of betrayal and disillusionment about whose interests the university actually serves. I mean, they have multi-billion dollar endowments. <laughs> yeah, and um, universities have left students and faculties to kind of fend for ourselves um, to try to reinvent a meaningful online curriculum and do our own fundraising uh, to make up for some of our lost resources. So this, this whole situation affects everyone in higher education, but uh, visual art MFAs are particularly vulnerable because we have such tenuous career paths and so much of our education is, is lost to remote learning. So where does this leave students? Um, American institutions certainly think of our education transactionally. And no one, students nor faculty, want to think of it this way. Of course, we'd all rather just focus on our pedagogical experience. But here we are. This is capitalism. Is there anything to be done? Well, hopefully. Um, and MFA students across the country are considering their options, whether that's taking legal action or other measures to resist becoming collateral damage of the pandemic. Uh, we have to end our talk now, but we've created a couple PDF handouts to help students think through their own situation and decide an appropriate course of action. A uh, link to these resources will be shared in the chat at the end of the presentations, and you can also find them on the event page on Q's website. So thanks again to everyone for attending. Yeah, thank you uh, and enjoy the rest of the program and see you in the breakout group. Thank you so much, uh, Narendra and Kayla. Our second field report uh, titled, Don't Worry, You'll Get Your Degree, will be held by Emma Sapphire and Diana Sophia Lozano, both artists currently based in New Haven, Connecticut, and MFA candidates at the Yale School of Art. Emma is an MFA candidate in the painting and printmaking department, and Diana is an MFA candidate in the sculpture department. Thanks, Joseph. Don't worry, you'll get your degree. Four myths about institutional care that MFA programs want, uh, MFA programs perpetuate. Before enrolling in an MFA program, one weighs the costs and the benefits. Attending graduate school demonstrates your commitment to your artistic practice, and it deserves to be taken seriously. 
This commitment comes with a range of expectations, uninterrupted time, access to facilities, critical discussion, community building, networking, and legitimacy. Investing in an MFA is playing the long game, theoretically leading to more opportunities to teach and exhibit. Given that COVID-19 has drastically limited the possibilities of an arts education and students face further financial precarity, we find ourselves asking, why have wealthy educational institutions abandoned their students and surrounding communities at a time when they need the most support? Is a lifetime membership in the MFA club worth the hefty price tag? The art world industrial complex feeds on the passion of artists willing to seize any available opportunity. Commercial art institutions offer exposures and excuse to deny fair compensation to artists. Museums tout their knowledge production in order to hide their complicity in racial capitalism and state-sanctioned violence. Higher art education is a cog in a hypercube powered by the exploitation of artists and cultural workers. Considering all of this, does higher art education support or exploit our aspirations? Myth number one, educational institutions are concerned about the well-being of their constituents. MFA programs present themselves as progressive sanctuaries that foster criticality and empathy. One would expect them to come to their students' aid during an unprecedented global crisis. However, their mission statements obscure a basic lack of care for the physical and emotional well-being of their constituents. In the midst of a public health and economic crisis, institutions have doubled down on neoliberal spending models, imposing austerity measures, such as hiring freezes and budget cuts, rather than drawing from their massive endowments. Meanwhile, faculty have been tasked with tapping into their networks in order to raise emergency funds for their students. Many art schools operate within larger research universities that consistently underfund them while superficially touting their strength in the arts. These art schools in particular have rejected student demands for tuition compensation while providing limited access to vital forms of support, such as emergency subsidies and healthcare extensions to graduating students. When asked how a studio in material-based education could possibly be replicated online, administrators re responded, don't worry, you'll get your degree. As the incoming class begins to ask questions about what the fall semester will look like, administrators and their lawyers scramble to draft responses that provide just enough information to secure tuition deposits. Despite long-term restrictions and access to facilities and resources, tuitions for the coming academic year continue to rise. Furthermore, financial aid and scholarship determinations fail to take into account the unexpected loss of income and job opportunities that many incoming students have experienced. The default institutional response has been to provide limited aid on an individual case-by-case -case basis to cover expenses related to transitioning to a virtual curriculum and working from home. This solution fails to account for basic living expenses and places a burden on students to prove and justify their financial need. Imposing this additional hurdle also unfairly disadvantages low-income, BIOPOC, and ESL students who already have a hard time navigating elite institutions. Now, more than ever, educational institutions should be doing everything in their power to help their students. Institutional care means providing for the physical and emotional well-being of their constituents so that they can teach, learn, and create to the best of their ability. Myth number two. Institutions with large endowments are more generous. Even well-endowed educational institutions prioritize the preservation of capital. In order to preserve the planned academic year, despite the possibility of a second wave this winter, institutions are seeking protection from potential COVID-19 related lawsuits. However, students are not just a liability. Their intellectual contributions are the lifeblood of their schools. Without taking the necessary steps to train and properly compensate their faculty for remote teaching and addressing issues for low income and differently abled students, institutions are sacrificing pedagogy for expediency. Although some institutions face serious risk of closure due to, to the pandemic, elite universities continue to hoard their endowments. For example, Yale boasts the second largest endowment in the world, valued at $30.31 billion, and pays approximately $500 million a year to hedge fund managers. However, it has only donated $2 million, or 0.006% of its endowment, to COVID-19 relief efforts within New Haven. Furthermore, Yale's endowment is entangled in fossil fuels, Puerto Rican debt, private prisons, and predatory lending companies, including those that service student loans. This past spring, many students turned to their financial aid offices for additional resources in order to stay afloat. Most students, regardless of their financial status, were asked to take out additional private loans upon exhausting their federal aid. It comes as no surprise that larger universities benefit from the student debt crisis. It is unacceptable that students at institutions with large endowments have no choice but to sink deeper into debt. 
institutions are asking students to be flexible and innovative in the face of unavoidable change. However, a lack of financial transparency creates an illusion of agency and further infantilizes the student body. In response, we propose equitable transparency that would allow for informed decision making. Consensus is built on developing and enacting trust, not through domination and fear. Myth number three, educational institutions are safe and inclusive spaces. In a country that provides such little public support to artists, building a sustainable professional career in the arts feels nearly impossible without an MFA. Therefore, we demand an in-depth analysis of institutions preoccupied with the optics of diversity. As proclaimed by Angela Davis, diversity is a corporate strategy, and we cannot expect change and inclusion without complete structural transformation of the MFA program as we know it. Despite the vast accumulation of wealth by elite universities, their response to COVID-19 has been negligible. Our programs that reside within larger universities are an extension of these institutions. And although they have limited jurisdiction over resources and administrative decisions, their omission of these issues within their own curriculum speaks volumes. Higher education has underfunded the arts for decades, despite the significant cultural capital and demographic diversity that these programs confer. During times of heightened awareness, educational institutions perform allyship by co-opting the image and labor of black and brown artists. Vague public statements that tokenize scholars and students of color are not enough. Institutional care means pr promoting and upholding the ethics of racial justice. Develop decolonized curricula. Acknowledge the institution's history of racial capitalism and violence. Diversify full-time tenured faculty. Require diversity and bias training for all members of the institution. Commit to dismantling institutional police departments. Halt institutional gentrification. Amplify bio POC voices within both the institution and surrounding communities. Provide monetary reparations. The bottom line is all education should be free. It includes as it should include access to free healthcare, emergency funding not tied to federal or private lenders, and resources that address the diverse mental and emotional needs of students, faculty, and staff. Amid a global pandemic and uprisings against police brutality, well-endowed institutions have the opportunity to address injustices to the most direct action, reparations. These institutions should lead through advocacy instead of waiting until an action in silence is detrimental to their reputation. In the case of Yale, which has a private police department that reinforces the divide between students in the surrounding community and whose endowment supports private prisons, the need for divestment and reparations is self-evident. The constant surveillance and policing of black and brown communities, both within and outside the institution, is the antithesis of care. Myth number four, students are automatically complicit in the actions of their university. As billing deadlines loom on the horizon, students are demanding that administrators make steadfast commitments to prioritize the quality of their education and well-being. Instead, institutions suggest taking a leave of absence for students unwilling or unable to make proposed compromises. However, taking a leave of absence imposes additional financial burdens and results in the loss of crucial mental and physical health services, including gender-affirming treatments. This illusion of choice obscures institutional neglect. Living in the shadow of an institution that ignores the urgent needs of its constituents and describes its endowment as a collection of gifts, not a rainy day fund, is mentally and emotionally taxing for students. Do we accept this toxic dynamic as a means of moving forward? Despite the limited options that students face during this crisis, re remaining within their institution does not require conceding to its actions. Students can organize to hold their schools accountable and pressure them to enact the changes that we want to see. As seen in the past month, pandemic, the pandemic demands that we interrogate, interrogate our entanglements in racial capitalism and systemic oppression. What we do when social distancing limits organizing, what do we do when social distancing limits organizing and community dialogue? Is it possible to be part of the existing institutional model without working against our political interests? What does solidarity look like during a pandemic? Thank you everyone that contributed to this presentation and to the Q Foundation for hosting us. Uh, you can see the event page for resources where we have compiled a worksheet, are you in an abusive relationship with your school, a checklist for institutional accountability. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Emma and Diana. Um, our third field report is actually in the form of a video and it will be led by the Intimacy Working Group. Uh, the Intimacy Working Group is made up of a group of artists in the MFA program at UCLA. Um, they are Aaliyah Adegwame, a 
multidisciplinary Ibo Vincentian American artist scholar and an MFA candidate in interdisciplinary studio, Kiara Amaya Gopi, uh, who is a multidisciplinary artist from Carapichaima, Trinidad and Tobago, and they are an MFA candidate in interdisciplinary studio as well. Kimi Hanauer, who is an artist, cultural organizer and founder of Press Press, which is a publishing studio that aims to shift and deepen the understanding of voices, identities, and narratives that have been suppressed or misrepresented. And Kimi is an MFA candidate in interdisciplinary studio as well. Hemi Kim, an artist from Detroit based in Los Angeles and currently an MFA student with a concentration in new genres. And Amelia Lockwood, who is an artist from Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, currently based in LA and she received her MFA in ceramics. My name is Kimmy. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I am a second year, or I just finished my second year at UCLA in the interdisciplinary program. Hi, I'm Kiara. Um, my pronouns are they, them. And I just finished my first God for second year in UCLA's interdisciplinary studio program. I'm Hemi. I use she, her pronouns, and I just finished my second year in new genres. I'm Alia. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I just finished my first year in interdisciplinary studio. I am Amelia. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I just finished my third year at UCLA in ceramics. types of cards and it's just like principal cards, question cards, tactic cards, medium, form and team. Um, and basically when you pull these cards it's supposed to like use them to like jog you to like come up with some sort of action or thing, or thing that you want to talk about just to direct how you would do it. Okay, I pulled for principles I pulled the basic and well accepted no the principle I pulled is economic justice. The basic and well accepted principle of fairness where the consequence of official policy should be the equal allocation of benefits among participants in an, in an economy. What is our goal? See how that just came back around. <laughs> this is a tactic to achieve whatever the goal is. Like time banking. Mm. Amazing. Um, a time bank is a commun community work trading system where a person who volunteers a talent or skill can bank or trade hours of work for equal hours of work in another skill or talent instead of exchanging money. I don't know how we'll use medium, but I guess. Theoretically, as we all do. Um, collage. Do that as you will. Ooh. I love that because we're also like a group. <laughs> <laughs> and then this form, which is basically like literally just forms that they have to think about. Um, yeah, direction. Mm. And last we have team. Um, Team is humor. Humor. Because we're always laughing in here. Mm -hmm. Aww. Concerning amusement or comedy, consider how humor and satire can simulate laughter as well as serve as a vehicle to explore serious subjects. Yeah, I like time banking a lot too because it, it recognizes, like this group recognize different people's roles um, in a way 
that I don't feel like an institutional structure does. I feel like, or what you're saying reminds me of like this feeling of, I think in other like classrooms or in like academic culture in general at UCLA, like I feel like there's this been, there's been this like expectation of me and I've seen of other people like to assimilate to a certain like way of doing things or like structure of the class, which like isn't always so like, I don't know, doesn't feel right for my learning or my overall experience. And I think in this group, even though we never, I don't think we said that explicitly in the beginning, I think there is this understanding of like, we work to kind of fit each other and like whatever the space asks for each time rather than being like, okay, every day we're gonna do it. Take what we did like as individuals working collectively and like apply it to other things. Um, that like nimbleness, that like responsiveness, um, but it's like a work in progress. Mm -hmm. So it's hard. I, I, I'm thinking about that too, like that distinction between response and um, reaction, essentially like we, you know, we can, the nimbleness makes us proactive in that <laughs> We always have. We already have a response, and our response is to be nimble, is to be, is to be quick in how we determine what the best action is. Or we can also determine that this is a long-term action, and that maybe this might have to happen at a later date, at a, at a later time. Um, yeah, like I say, it just doesn't have the, the institution just doesn't have the capacity. She just doesn't have the range, mm -hmm. and I really think that this sort of thing is really critical for like visioning like you're saying I wonder if the scale actually just means like embodying the things that we talk about in the same way that Leah is talking about like you know translating um that nimbleness to other things in your life but it's something that takes a lot of practice and that way it is scaled from the individual and if you want to do something that is corralled in like a specific way then that could be a decision but it just, yeah, it, it maybe it's just like a way of living mm -hmm. that you have to develop. Talking about like what like a practice, a creative practice looks like in some of these terms. And so it's like really ironic, I think, to be like, oh, that's also maybe the answer to our problem, but we created it because th this like was lacking in the first place, or for me at least. Mm -hmm this toxic environment where everyone's just competing with one another, including like even faculty and students. Um, I wonder how, maybe, maybe it'll always be that way. And I always feel like the best art teachers are the people who are acutely aware that they are also learning. That only is transmitted based on who people know um, is something that like reifies the um, types of um, asymmetrical power dynamics and the types of like socially constructed, um, I don't know, relations <laughs> that we're supposed to as artists like think about how to destroy and like show to be something that is like human constructed and unsettled. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it was. Your experience is like different. Mm -hmm. it's, it hasn't always felt like competitive. And like, I think the kind of thing that we started to unravel that with your comment, Kiara, as well, is like, that what does it mean that people depending on like various things um from how people are gendered differently and racialized differently and um a million other reasons what does it mean that people have such wildly different experiences of the same place mm -hmm. and what does that actually say about how equity exists in that space The ways that like intimacy working group I think has enabled me to think about 
like has enabled me to reflect on uh, an experience that like honestly like I repressed a lot of just because it really has like shown me the ways that like MFAs don't have to be so damaging they don't have to be so isolating and isolated like where it's just a competition to be in America's next top (laughs) essay writer but I also feel like we have to be able to like be right and also be wrong like in an interpersonal setting and I don't know if that's something that like even we have worked out just yet Mm -hmm. you know like what it looks like to make amends or reflect or call out or call in like people who have harmed and what like bringing pedagogy into all of that like how that like also makes it more complicated let's kill the institution (laughs) i think mfa should be over um i think mfas have run their course in the current format the most beneficial learning experiences I've gotten over the past three years have been from y'all, you know, and from like this, this community. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You know, it's like, it's, 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 it's just the community, the student community. So that's how I felt and y'all specifically, but. Um, That was wonderful. Uh, This next field report on rethinking, reimagining, and recalibrating pedagogies will be led by Christina Barrera, an artist and educator based in New York City, and she's a fourth semester MFA candidate at Hunter College. Thanks, Joseph, uh, and thank you all for being here. So I'm giving this talk for two reasons. First, the Hunter MFA program is starting a pedagogy group and we're encouraging you all to do the same. Second, uh, not only will most artists end up as educators at some point, but we're here because we're experiencing a massive shift in both social consciousness and status quo conditions. So we're gonna briefly discuss how to create or retool your own pedagogies with the idea of implementing change at your current program. The topic at hand really starts with what is an MFA? And from the institution of the MFA up until now, this is how we've been answering that question. At its most basic, it's a degree, and we have three typical models, the two-year MFA, the three-year MFA, and the low-residency MFA. Um, These are the most common across both public institutions, which are publicly funded and state-run, and private institutions, which are either nonprofits funded through the private sector or privately owned businesses. Now, of course, these models haven't always been here. The MFA is not synonymous with being or becoming an artist historically or now, even as it's become increasingly seen as required. What an MFA is meant to offer in terms of product or credentials is well advertised, but when we square those offers with the fact that the profession, quote unquote, of artists doesn't actually require credentials, Um, then we're left with the question, what is an MFA meant to offer in terms of education, in terms of experience? And that is a question for pedagogy. In the catalog for the 2001 exhibit, Public Offerings, Lane Brelia writes, hanging out, talking shop, and making connections with faculty and visiting artists has replaced the systems and codifications of pedagogy, syllabi, and seminars. Community and connections are an important part of the experience of an MFA program and important part of being an artist, but it's really important to ask what more an educational experience and framework is meant to foment beyond connections. To answer the question of the MFA in a different way, we have to start with the frameworks of our programs and that starts with understanding what pedagogy is. Pedagogy is not curriculum but rather the method of teaching that guides curriculum and educational experiences. At the heart of pedagogy are theories of interaction. Ultimately, pedagogies are a way of being with people that center an educational experience. Artist and educator Pablo Elguera sums things up really well. Pedagogy and education are about emphasis on the embodiment of the process, on the dialogue, on the exchange, 
on intersubjective communication and on human relationships. To build or interrogate our own pedagogy, we have to ask ourselves, what is education? This question has a long history and that history can be helpful. John Dewey, foundational figure of the progressive education movement in the US, believes that education is a social process, a process of living and not a preparation for future living. That learning can be solitary, but the practice of education cannot be. The idea that the body and its environment physical experience and reflection on that experience are all central to meaningful learning and discovery of the self was pivotal to the progressive education reform movement, both in the US and in Europe. In the US, higher education and art derives much of its foundations from the Bauhaus, its peer institutions and its direct successor, Black Mountain College, all of which were massively influenced by the educational philosophies and theories that drove these movements. This is all to say that there's a lot to gain by looking at self-organized education, action-based research schools, study groups, and collectives. Looking towards models that are deliberately outside of formalized learning environments is important, even if they wouldn't function in a more institutional structure. So a valid question is, why don't we just start our own school? Uh, it's a question a lot of people are asking and it's a super viable option, um, but it's also, there's also an argument to be made for staying and bettering your program that doesn't just have to do with some costs. Returning to Pablo Higuera, he argues that abandoning institutions capitulates to a neoliberal agenda of dismantling the public institution altogether. Self-organized educational models are really valuable, um, but so are institutions, particularly public ones. When we dismantle the public institution, we dismantle public services. In his words, sometimes we can best be revolutionaries when we learn to be institutional. And as institutions are collapsing and being dismantled left and right, this feels like potentially one of those times. It's worth noting that this argument doesn't hold for private institutions in quite the same way. A parallel argument for saying, however, is that there are very few ways to control and regulate the private sector. And one of those is through the demands of their consumer base. So Hunter's Pedagogy Group, proposed and facilitated by faculty member Paul Ramirez Jonas, is planned to start meeting later this summer. Uh, and we can't tell you exactly what's gonna result, but we can tell you that it aims to be an open but focused forum of students, faculty, and staff guided by Paulo Freire's liberationist pedagogy. The reimagining of the program was prompted by how COVID-19 restricts our previous models. But beyond that, the goal is to take the necessity to adapt to COVID conditions as an opportunity to assess the entire program, starting with its core ideologies. In Paul's words, the aim is to imagine a curriculum based on your lived experience as human beings and artists, mapping that knowledge and then translating it into a curriculum. If we do this honestly, it will open the doors to the ways in which we can address systemic racism, economic inequality, the relevance of art, etc. Why? Because it will come from you. So Artist Collective BFA MFA PhD in collaboration with New York based pedagogy group published a great guide to forming a pedagogy group that's going to be included in our resources link that everyone has mentioned so far. Um, it's a really great resource on how to get started and the practicalities and logistics of forming a group, but here we're going to focus more on how to work together and guide your conversations. Once you have a group in place, you can start by asking questions which can lead to setting goals. If you can start over the summer, it can be really helpful to schedule an intensive working period to start off. Anywhere from a single day to a whole week of workshopping can be very productive. In order to be most effective, your discussion should start with basics that we often consider defaults, like what is a school? What purpose does a school serve? What is an education and art making? How do we learn? What are we learning? Why are we learning these things and not others? What are we not learning and why? How does our institution operate? How does the form of the program manifest in the curriculum? How is knowledge transferred within the institution? What is the role of the artist? And is that taught or discovered? Do we believe the work of the artist is solitary? How does what happens in the institution make us better artists? What are the ways in which we meet? Under what conditions and to do what? What's the role of faculty? And how do the role of student and the role of faculty feed each other? For public programs, it's also important to ask questions like, is a public school a service? Is that service provided? What is the constituency of the public school? Is there an obligation to provide some collective benefit to that constituency? What might that mean for an art school? How does the form of the program, how is the form of the program different from private programs? Does it need to be? 
And how does it embody a belief in public education? There are a thousand more questions that build from here and your group should find them together. Uh, it's important that this kind of examining happen at all institutions, but particularly important for public programs. Ideally, public education both forms and is formed by the public it serves and is served by. It must be continually reevaluated to best serve its public. And then of course, the question of whether online formats can work for MFAs at all is huge right now. So how you answer that problem will depend entirely on how you answer the previous questions and the many more they'll give rise to, both for your specific program and for your practice within it. What's crucial for both students and faculty to acknowledge when approaching the idea of online curriculum is that in order for an educational experience to be fruitful and generative, the material conditions that form both the physical and ideological environment in which the experience takes place is what must guide the formation of the experience. A course that takes place in an online environment must be designed to best function and make use of the capabilities of that environment. Returning to the pedagogy group, different ways of working are gonna lend themselves to different tasks. Open-ended free-flowing conversations are helpful in establishing a wide scope. If there's tension in the program, an airing out period can be cathartic and for some educational, it exposes what issues most need addressing um, and it can sometimes be a good place to start if you have good facilitation. Focus discussions with the whole group are particularly good for big ideological questions that'll guide future work. Small groups are great for brainstorming, collective research, fleshing out ideas and tactics and working on multiple projects. This is also a good format to hear from people who might not speak up in bigger groups and it should be used regularly. Lastly, inviting guests can be super valuable. Consider both inviting speakers or facilitators and the possibility of public events like teach-ins. Also, sometimes pedagogy groups develop collaborative texts or public presentations, which can be helpful for both the group and the public. Whether you're working with, around, or actively against your institution, it's important to include both actionable items, clear demands, and a timeline for short-term and longer-term goals in your discussions. How you might pass on your work and create institutional memory outside of faculty lines is also something important to consider and plan for. Your group might start off as a student only or faculty only endeavor, but at some point the two are gonna have to come together. The idea that education is co-created through conversation by those currently in the role of student and those currently in the role of professor is extremely important. Two base guidelines that are gonna be crucial to a truly successful student faculty pedagogy group are, number one, students must actively participate. If we believe that education is not a product, then students must commit to not embodying the role of consumer or passive customer. Number two, faculty and administration must recognize that students bring knowledge and experience with them and have a right to participate in the shaping of their education. That in fact, education should always be shaped to, for, and by the students. Educators guide students in their educational experiences and students guide the educator in what experiences are needed, desired, or will prove fruitful to these students at this time and in this place. I wanna end by saying that this work is always useful, even if it doesn't create change in your current program, although that should definitely be the goal. MFA candidates are not students for long. We move back into the role of simply artist and into many other roles, including the role of educator. We educate our peers, we direct our own learning in the studio, and we'll educate other artists or the public whether we mean to or not. It's much better to be intentional, equipped with a solid foundation for your methods and a thorough understanding of how, why, and in what way you contribute to the educational systems and relationships we build. You might not hold power for long enough to change your current program as much as you'd like, but you can change systems in the future if you know how and what you wanna build. I'm looking forward to the breakout group. Um, we're gonna have resources in the resource folder, just like everyone else, including a study guide. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, Christina, and for all of the other artists for your fantastic field reports. Now we're going to begin our three simultaneous breakout sessions. So um, if you'd like to attend the intimacy working group, breakout, please stay in this Zoom. And if you'd like to attend the breakout sessions on teaching in an MFA program post COVID and the uh, pedagogy um, breakout session, you'll find the links in the chat.